afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining LABC's 15th Annual Sustainability Summit. My name is Brian Lehman. I'm the head of Green Economy Coverage for J.P. Morgan Chase Commercial Banking. It's my privilege to introduce our congressional keynote, Congressman Stephen Horsford. And on behalf of my colleagues at J.P. Morgan Chase, we're thrilled to serve as a sponsor for this year's Sustainability Summit. Countless studies have reinforced the urgency of mitigating climate change by achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Just last week, the International Energy Agency reported that clean energy investment needs to double in this decade to maintain temperatures well below a two degree centigrade increase and more than triple to keep the door open for a one and a half degree increase. To achieve these aggressive carbon neutrality goals, as the US largest financial institution at JP Morgan, we've got the responsibility to use our capabilities to address climate change head on. And in order to do this, we need collective commitment from the public, private, and political uh, sectors. We need to find common ground between business goals and political priorities. We must create economic opportunity that is not only more sustainable, but also more inclusive. And we must dedicate the right expertise, leadership and capital to bring these visions to life. For years, the firm has provided expertise and financial services to help sustainable companies scale in the industries, including alternative energy, food technology and sustainable production. And our recent commitments illustrate how serious we are about making market conditions even more favorable for sustainable development. In the past year, we've launched a strategy to align our financing portfolio with the goals of the Paris Agreement and implemented our carbon compass methodology to measure our progress. We pledged two and a half trillion dollars to finance activities that address climate change directly. We've announced a plan to help our oil and gas, electric power, and auto manufacturing clients transition their businesses to sustainable models. And in April, we launched Commercial Banking's Green Economy Team, which I have the honor of leading. Specifically, the Green Economy Team is focused on serving the unique banking needs of renewable energy, sustainable finance, agriculture and food technology, and efficiency technology clients. Of course, creating market-based solutions to reduce emissions also requires cooperation across the public and private sectors. As part of our support for pricing carbon, J.P. Morgan Chase is a member of the Climate Leadership Council, a think tank that is promoting a bipartisan roadmap for a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend framework for the US. The firm also participates in several forums to understand and mitigate the risk that climate change poses to financial institutions and markets. And our ongoing conversations with government partners, officials like Congressman Horsford are vital to helping drive sustainable development forward. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting Congressman Horsford, he is a proven champion for working families across the country. In the 117th Congress, he has committed to beating the coronavirus, getting Nirvana's economy back on track and restoring public faith in American institutions. He's made history as Nevada's first African-American state Senate majority leader. He's worked across party lines to solve the worst budget crisis in state history when Nevada's economy was devastated during the recession. He sits on the House Ways and Means Committee, the oldest and most powerful committee of the US Congress and co-leads its racial equity initiative. And he's a champion for green economic, economic recovery, passing the Clean Energy Jobs Initiative and positioning Nevada as a leader in renewable energy. Representative Horsford is the type of leader that understands the power of public and private partnership and the critical role that it will play in helping us to achieve sustainability goals and carbon neutrality by 2050, if not sooner. Please give a warm welcome to Congressman Stephen Horsford. Well, thank you so much, Brian, uh, for that overly generous introduction. And I wanna thank uh, the Los Angeles Business Council for bringing us together for these important conversations about sustainability and climate leadership and what each of us can do uh, in this regard. Already today, we've heard from some of the most effective leaders in the fight 
on climate change. I'm grateful to Mayor Garcetti, who's been a good friend and supporter, Los Angeles Business Council President Mary Leslie, and Chairwoman Nadine Watt for partnering with the LA Business Council to host this important forum. And I wanna recognize my colleague, Senator Alex Padilla, who spoke about climate change from a federal lens earlier today. Over the last six months, Americans have witnessed a much needed turnaround in US climate policy. Uh, I'm really honored uh, that just yesterday, I had Sen uh, Secretary Jennifer Granholm, uh, the Secretary of the Department of Energy here in my district, um, along with our governor and other leaders talking about the work that we're doing at the state level, but also uh, the work that's being done under the uh, Biden-Harris administration around creating a clean, green economy. And on his first day in office, President Joe Biden began the process of rejoining uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, reasserting our role as a global climate leader, and by choosing John Kerry, the former Secretary of State, as the special presidential envoy for climate, President Biden demonstrated an understanding of the danger that climate change possesses to every part of our national and global interest. In the West, we're already seeing the impact of climate change in devastating wildfires in California, higher temperatures here in Nevada, and dangerous heat. But the impact of our warming planet goes beyond that. President Biden, Secretary Granholm, uh, Secretary Kerry, and other experts around the world have made clear that unchecked climate change poses a dangerous threat to our national security, our economic stability, and our health. Thankfully, we are now seeing the urgent action that our nation needs. In April, President Biden set an ambitious goal to achieve a 50% reduction from 2005 levels in economy-wide net greenhouse gas pollution in 2030. And just last month, he put sustainability at the top of the agenda by outlining his America the Beautiful Plan, a locally-led campaign to conserve 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. The United States cannot solve climate change alone, nor is that our obligation. But our leadership sets the tone for the rest of the world. When the world's biggest economy is committed to stopping climate change, our fellow nations lose their excuses for inaction. Now, there's no question that new leadership in the White House and Congress has made a tremendous difference in our approach to the climate crisis. But I wanna recognize and celebrate the important role of our business community in achieving these aims as well. Your constant advocacy and your own commitments to environmental governance have helped federal and local policymakers set and meet our sustainability goals. Here in our part of the country, those efforts are making a profound impact. With the abundant sun, wind and geothermal energy resources of the West, our region is poised to be a leader in clean energy creation. Here in my state, a home state of Nevada, we've set a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in net, to net zero by 2050. And I believe that we can and will meet that goal. The challenge now uh, that, that we now face is how do we maintain our existing progress? And how do we forge ahead with new bold solutions? Nevada, California, and all of our Western neighbors understand how to leverage our natural resources to create clean, clean power. But frankly, the current strength of our electric grid is not sufficient to meet our clean power goals. Over the years to come, we need serious investments to expand the grid and carry clean power from the rural areas where it is produced to the high demand regions where it is most needed. Now I know that we have a whole panel that will discuss the importance of overhauling our grid, so I'll let them go more in depth on that topic. But over the last few months alone, we've seen clear examples that demonstrate the consequences of underinvestment in our power infrastructure. In February, more than four 
1.8 million Texans' homes and businesses were left without power after a devastating winter storm. I, I'm never going to be able to forget the heartbreaking images of families huddled around barbecues and car heaters in order to stay home, in, in order to stay warm. That grid failure killed hundreds of people with the most vulnerable families suffering the most. We cannot afford to let something like that happen again. In Texas, there were systemic issues with grid management, but without major investments in our electric grid, we could see that tragedy repeated in other places in the country. And we need to be prepared for these new threats, like the ransomware attack that took Colonial Pipeline offline and led to gas shortages across the East Coast. These catastrophes are preventable, but we need proactive investments and a nationwide commitment to building transmission lines that will transport clean power and increase our energy supply. That's where legislative action comes in. Earlier this year, I introduced the Electric Power Infrastructure Act with Senator Martin Heinrich and my fellow colleague, Congresswoman Susie Lee here in Nevada two other Sunbelt lawmakers who understand the potential that sustainable power can unlock for our region. Recently, a study from Americans for a Clean Energy Grid identified 22 shovel-worthy high-voltage transmission projects that would increase America's wind and solar generation by nearly 50%. Our bill would create a tax credit for these projects and would give private industry the boost needed to get them off the ground. Each of the 22 projects will bring substantial benefits. I wanna highlight one of them, the Trans West Line, which would have substantial benefits for California and Nevada specifically. Just a few states away in Wyoming, vast wind energy resources can produce huge amounts of power. But as things stand now, there are few opportunities for Sunbelt sun states to use that power. The Trans-West Line would transport power across our region, delivering power benefits to cities like Los Angeles, Phoenix, San Diego, and my home city of Las Vegas. The energy potential of this project is truly stunning. The wind power produced in Wyoming is roughly equivalent to three quarters of the electric power used in Los Angeles alone. Power from the Trans-West Line would complement the solar energy that is produced in California and Nevada and accelerate our transition from non-renewable fuels. And in times of solar abundance, the Trans-West Line can transport our energy surplus across the West. The Trans-West Line and projects like it would transform our access to clean, renewable power to meet our sustainability goals. But even more importantly, they would create good family supporting jobs across our region. And those jobs cannot come at a more important time. The COVID-19 pandemic led to extraordinary job losses in my state of Nevada and across the country. So as we reflect on the past year and we begin to rebuild and to build back better as President Biden says, two things are very clear. First, the erosion of worker power over the past decades has left millions of American workers vulnerable and one step away from a crisis. Second, we have a crisis of low wage jobs. In my district and across the country, countless families are forced to cobble together multiple full-time jobs in order to make ends meet. Thankfully, investments in electric power offer the opportunity to make progress on both of these fronts. Estimates from the American Council on Renewable Energy show that my bill, the Electric Power Infrastructure Improvement Act, would support more than a half a million jobs, most in the skilled union trades. These jobs would strengthen our long-term economic recovery from COVID-19 and create a labor demand for trained, unionized workforces that will be available far beyond one transmission project. I'm thrilled about the job creation potential of these investments, but it's just one way that expanding transmission will help our working families. During the pandemic, 
nearly one third of American households struggle to pay their energy bills with black and Hispanic families suffering disproportionately. According to an ACOR analysis, expanding the power supply by investing in transmission will provide $2.3 billion in cost savings for the lower 80% of income brackets. This is huge. And it means the money that we invest in clean energy will go straight into the pockets of middle and working class consumers. Outside of halls like these, I know that sustainability can often feel like a secondary priority to big issues like healthcare and jobs, but they're really one in the same. When we talk about investing in electric transmission, we're talking about real benefits that will lift up American families. As our planet warms, we know that low-income communities struggle the most with dangerous pollution, rising sea levels, and changing temperatures. By investing in clean energy transmission, we can make our communities healthier, healthier, safer, and more prosperous places for America's children to grow up. So I hope that these undeniable benefits are something that all of us, regardless of party affiliation, can get behind and support. President Biden has prioritized transmission in his American Jobs Plan, which reflects the real urgency in Washington around this issue. And I look forward to partnering with many of you as we work to pass a transmission investment tax credit in the law. With sustainability investments and infrastructure, we have the ability to build back better in a more equitable and inclusive way with lower energy prices and a reliable grid that will provide clean power for a clean future. So I wanna thank you again uh, for allowing me to be here today. I wanna to thank everyone for being here for, their, for this important work on our sustainability journey. Uh, and now I'm excited to turn this over to our panel for an in-depth conversation about our electric grid. Thank you all very much. We now welcome our next panel, Overhauling the Nation's Grid Infrastructure and Impacts on Our Regional Economy, moderated by Mary Nichols, former chair of the California Air Resources Board. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, listen to the speech and uh, it couldn't have been a better introduction to the uh, topic that this panel has been assigned. Uh, Congressman made it uh, very clear that meeting our federal and state clean energy goals requires a major investment to build a 21st century electric grid that increases capacity for distributed energy resources and enables smart technology. The federal government has made it a key priority to invest in the expansion and modernization of America's electric grid as a means to deliver clean energy in a reliable way and create good paying jobs. California, for its part, has already uh, been focused on grid modernization and has invested uh, resources in this, uh, in this to uh, uh, help us meet our goals of producing 100% clean energy by 2045, while focusing on enhanced safety, reliability, and resiliency in the face of growing natural disasters. This panel is intended to go into more depth on what investments actually need to be made to modernize the grid, what kinds of investments and how we can actually make sure that we do spur job creation and increase reliability and resiliency, as well as to call out barriers that might uh, slow this transition. So I'm gonna start off right away uh, with uh, going to the members of the panel. I am not gonna introduce them um, other than to just call out their name and positions. So uh, you can look them up if you wanna know more about who they are. But I'd like to start with, um, I'd like to start with Jennifer Kropke and there she is. Um, 
So Jennifer was appointed uh, very early on in the Biden administration to, a, I believe, a newly created position, uh, an Office of Energy Jobs. And I'm hoping you can start off, this is Undersecretary Granholm, of course, uh, who is one of the uh, key cabinet officials leading the entire climate effort in this administration. And uh, Jennifer comes from Los Angeles, so uh, I know her from her former life and I'm excited to uh, welcome her back. So Jennifer, tell us about this new office and uh, what your role is um, with respect to the environmental and job uh, goals that we've just outlined. Well, thank you so, so much. And thank you to LABC. And that was a tough act to follow, um, but I will attempt to follow it. I'm very excited to be here and tell you a little bit about the Office of Energy Jobs. The Office of Energy Jobs is a newly created position within the Department of Energy. And quite simply, what this office is intended to do is demonstrate the importance of taking labor into consideration in all of our energy planning and to develop policies around energy that consider our workforce as much as our renewable energy goals. So I'm very, very excited to be here and talk a little bit about that and to tell you that the focus of our office is really looking around how the Department of Energy in connection with all of our federal sister, sister agencies can create jobs that are careers, create careers that have family sustaining wages and create careers that build back better by having intentionality in terms of who is on our job sites, how they get onto our job sites, and how we can create more worker equity in everything that we do at the Department of Energy. So it sounds like you have a sort of an oversight role uh, of many activities that are going on within the department, but I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about how you see expansion and modernization of the power grid as a priority here for the jobs that we're trying to create and what tools the department can apply to get this done. Well, we know um, to achieve all of our ambitious clean energy goals, we know we need more transmission and distribution. We know that, um, and we've known that for a little bit. So a couple of things that we're working on here at the Department of Energy is, number one, labor standards around transmission and distribution. And a lot of it is done in coordination with our great utilities. We've got some amazing utilities. Um, I'm spoiled, I come from California. So I feel like I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with some of the best in the country. But a lot of those contain a highly unionized workforce who are already receiving family sustaining wages. So it's kind of like, gosh, guys, this is low hanging fruit. We can continue um, creating great jobs in the space. So one of them is around labor standards, but the second one is, is what can the DOE do to help this along? So I think maybe some of you have seen this or maybe some of you have not seen this, but we announced recently an offering of 8.25 billion in loans for transmission and distribution. So part of it is this recognition that we need more capacity to be able to achieve all of our clean energy and distributed energy resources goal. We know that and we've already seen that in states like California because I'm just gonna be honest, we lead the nation mm -hmm. in all of this great stuff. So we've had a lot of lessons that have been learned in California, but as well, we know that we've got to start moving there. We've got to start moving faster and we have to do it with a greater sense of urgency, much more so than we've had knowledge of and the ability to in the past. Right. Well, um, that leads me next to uh, one of the people who's had responsibility for crafting the state's integrated resource plan and uh, many other activities here. And that would be uh, my former colleague, Cliff Rechschaffen. Um, and uh, Cliff, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, given this new emphasis on new transmission investments, um, how is California positioned to compete uh, for some of the funds that we're hoping are going to be flowing for this activity uh, and to use those to help us meet our goals of 100% renewable energy by 2045. Well, the main thing we did is we have J people like Jennifer in the Department of Energy who, who <laughs> sing the praises of California and tell us how advanced <laughs> we are and, and uh, how great our utilities are. So that's terrific and it's so nice to hear 
about the role that you're playing in the incredible leadership that we're seeing from Secretary Granholm uh, so far. And Jennifer is exactly right. We have very ambitious decarbonization goals. They're going to require uh, a lot of zero emission resources and thereby uh, transmission. And just to give you some context, by the middle of twenty four, the middle of the twenty forties decade, twenty forty five, we will probably need three times the installed capacity of our current mix, and, and that means an incredible amount of new solar over a hundred gigawatts of new solar, 30 gigawatts of new wind, both onshore and offshore, 50 gigawatts of, of new batteries. So we know we'll need a lot of infrastructure to support this unprecedented amount of resources. Uh, Mary, you mentioned the integrated resource planning process. That's the process where we at the Public Utilities Commission for the state's investor-owned utilities determine the amount, the type and location of new resources and the transmission that is needed to get there. We plan for how to meet these deep decarbonization goals. Every year we develop a, a scenario of the different resources that need to be developed to meet these targets. We send them over to the grid operator, the California Independent System Operator which studies the transmission upgrades needed to bring those resources online and the costs. Uh, and, and that's the process. We know we're gonna have to rely to some ex a considerable extent on utility scale solar and wind projects that are long distances from the load we serve. Uh, and that and some of that's in the desert, some of that's out of state, some of that's off uh, the California coast, and we're uh, delighted that we have an administration that is so interested in partnering with us on developing offshore resources. So just to give you uh, an example, the, uh, a concrete example, in February, this past February, we submitted to the CAISO a portfolio of resources that meet a greenhouse gas target uh, that's consistent with our 2030 goals. We're, we're likely going to uh, make that target more stringent in the next year or so. Um, and that included having the ISO study transmission that would be needed to, uh, to, to serve various uh, out-of-state wind and solar projects, as well as 8,000 megawatts potentially of offshore wind resources at various locations. So that's our process. Uh, uh, and of course, we're always uh, interested in bringing those transmission projects to bear at the least cost possible, which I'm sure we'll talk about as this panel goes forward. Sure, but just uh, before I let you go after these brief introductory uh, remarks, um, I, I sense that some have tried to create a, a dichotomy or a conflict between investments in new transmission versus microgrids and battery storage, or to see them as competition with each other. And I'm just wondering what you can say about the role that any of these will play in the overall effort to get to resilience and reliability. Well, we'll need all of the above, and all of the above doesn't mean coal, gas, and, and other fossil resources. It means we'll need all of the above in terms of our clean energy resources, and that includes both demand-side resources like batteries and consumer-facing programs that reduce demand, as well as distributed energy resources, as well as utility scale resources. Just the, the, the scale of what needs to be done is unprecedented and we'll need everything to be brought to bear. Microgrids and storage play, well, let me back up. Storage will play a very, very important role in integrating resources because we know as we transition off uh, <clears throat> fossil resources, we need zero emitting firm resources or clean resources that can uh, fill the gap when the sun doesn't shine and the wind's not blowing. And, and so batteries are gonna be a very important part of our resource mix. Just to give you some context, as a result of a decision we reached at the PUC in 2019, we are now gonna see a 
tenfold increase in the number of batteries coming online on the grid in the next summer, this summer and, and next summer. And as I said, we're going to need, you know, uh, close to 50 gigawatts of storage by, by, by 2045. Uh, but beyond that, the, there, we, we live in a state where we face a lot of external threats and we face, the, we, we face outages due to wildfires. We've, we faced potential outages due to just extreme heat storms and the intense demand uh, on our system and microgrids and, and batteries can play a very critical role in providing resilience to our customers. They can help ensure that essential services stay running during outages, whether it's caused by a wildfire or a proactive uh, public safety uh, power shutoff. Microgrids can help reduce electricity costs and peak load of a building or group of buildings using storage and other electricity generation. Hopefully most of that will be uh, renewable. And we've been doing a lot at the PUC to accelerate the development of microgrids and also the use of batteries to provide backup power uh, during outages. We, we devoted uh, over $600 million in a program known as our self-generating incentive program which is a customer-sided program, uh, customer-sided generation program to enable customers to provide, install batteries at basically a, a full subsidy if they are in high fire threat areas and if they're disadvantaged or medically vulnerable or serve critical infrastructure needs. Uh, and that program is gonna fund the installation of thousands of energy storage systems. Great. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna to wanna to come back, I think, to some questions there, but um, I'd like to next uh, introduce uh, our speaker from the solar energy industry, somebody who has actually built uh, solar installations with a company that he founded called Eight Minute Solar Energy. And so this is uh, Tom, uh, where are you? I saw your picture there, there you go. Okay, Tom Budenbach uh, is, uh, as someone who I want to really talk to about uh, what uh, it can actually take uh, to get the kind of deployment of renewables that we know we need. Uh, and I, I know you can uh, enlighten us on, on some of the practicalities of uh, the challenges that we will face in order to deploy the level of renewables that we've identified are needed by 2045 or even sooner if we uh, are gonna uh, meet the uh, announced goals uh, of the Biden administration. So um, I'd, I'd like to give you the floor here for a few moments to fill us in on uh, what we should be thinking about. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mary. And um, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, our company, Eight Minute Solar Energy, we, we do develop solar and integrated solar and energy storage power plants across the Western US and Texas. We have about 18 gigawatts right now under development and about 24 gigawatt hours of batteries. So we're in the trenches. We're working this every day. Um, there, are, um, there are a couple of areas where I think our industry needs some help in general. Um, and I applaud the Biden administration for setting very aggressive goals. Um, I think those are attainable um, and, and we are a nation of innovators. So I think we, as, as a country and as a state, um, we can push this agenda forward and go in that direction. The areas where I think we need some help um, is in, in the permitting process. And I don't, I'm not talking here about um, modifying CEQA or something like that. I think it's actually much simpler than that, which is um, if it takes you know, US Fish and Wildlife six months to even look at an application um, to build out transmission that we need or approve um, any kind of mitigation measures for, for a solar site, then, then that becomes a real bottleneck. So if we could start thinking about funding the agencies that actually enable this, it is relatively small dollars, but it really will unleash a lot of activity in terms of uh, being able to move projects forward so that rather than waiting years often um, in the permitting process that we can expedite this 
and, and, and accelerate the growth of the renewable sector, um, both in California and across the US. I think that's the first, the first area that, that, that's simple. Um, and there's a lot of good you know, folks out there looking for jobs um, that these agencies could hire that could really, really accelerate our growth. Second, we need 100%. Yeah, exciting. It's, it's great to start off with another opportunity for creation of some very good jobs, which is on the other side, the permitting side. Yeah, and it's really a bottleneck if you talk to any any company out there. Um, it, it's, you know, there is a lot of good intent, um, but a lot of these agencies are just overwhelmed. Um, and that's true both for federal agencies, local agencies, but also for counties. Mm -hmm. um, just simply, you know, the money to hire the right kind of people um, to process this and to do a good job. We, we all want to build things um, conscious of the environment and the impacts that we have. Um, so there, there's no question here for shortcuts. It just needs to get done. So that, that's really kind of our, our primary, primary task. The second one, more at the federal level, the investment tax credit has been an incredibly successful program. Um, now we're talking about adding in um, additional resources, um, adding in batteries, adding in transmission. Um, the tax equity markets that's funding all of this is simply um, constrained right now with, with the economic woes that we've gone through and the uncertainty about income levels for the tax equity investment community. We need a direct pay program. I know it's part of uh, the Biden administration package, but I can't emphasize enough how important it is. Um, literally in places like uh, <clears throat> California, Nevada, Texas, um, we could have started construction on gigawatts of projects if it wasn't for the fact um, that the tax equity markets are constrained. And without a direct pay program, our growth is severely hampered. Um, so I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to really unleash that. And, and the beauty of this, it, it doesn't come at any extra cost to, to the taxpayer. Um, this is just simplifying the process right now of, of getting, getting the money that has already been allocated into the tax equity uh, markets, getting that to projects much faster. Is that again a bottleneck in personnel or is there some specific policy that's the problem there? That would be a, a policy um, or law, I guess, in this case, um, that very similar to what we had in 2009, um, the 1603 cash grant program that basically short circuits the tax equity markets and lets you go directly to the federal government. So instead of going out to find investors that have a high tax liability and then they write it off their taxes and we make a deal with them, et cetera, um, that loop right now is, is, is severely um, clogged. Um, mm -hmm. You can go directly to the treasury um, and, and, and get a tax, um, get a tax uh, equity check from, from the treasury. Um, it's called direct pay. Um, so literally getting a check from the treasury as opposed to having to go through the tax equity markets. We think both in parallel should exist, um, that there's pros and cons, um, but having, having the alternative route um, really will accelerate the growth tremendously. We, we could have created literally, I think uh, we did the analysis um, um, just a few months ago. Um, our company alone could have created well over a thousand well-paying jobs if we would have had a direct pay program in place. What about technology? Can we use any technologies to help us also advance the infrastructure on the grid and transmission side? Absolutely. That's actually one of the areas our company specializes on what we call the, the smart power plant. Um, thanks to the confluence of new technologies that we have today, and that's not just solar panels have gotten cheaper, but battery technology have gotten um, cheaper and the quality has gotten much better, but also power electronics. We now have DC lines, we have networks. I can deploy an asset like the one you see behind me here um, and, and firm up power um, from other regions. Um, I, can, I can do grid stabilizing services today with high speed networked um, assets. Um, I, I can charge this power plant at night 
um, something that a fossil fuel plant can't do. And I can de deploy these resources um, in milliseconds rather than in you know minutes or hours like old uh, fossil fuel plants. So mm -hmm. this is kind of like having a smartphone versus a flip phone. Um, they, they both let you talk, um, but the new generation of smart power plants really is a tremendous game changer um, to deploy technologies to make our grid much more resilient, much faster in response, and provide a much higher quality service at a not only clean, but also now at, at a lower cost than burning fossil fuels. So this is an investment into the future. It'll have huge dividends. It's, it's you know, kind of a, a very high return investment uh, kind of decision that, that we've made that the Biden administration is pushing. It's the right thing to do for the environment, but it's also the right thing to do for the economy. And as a country, we are, we, we, we have the chance right now, which to me personally is satisfying. I'm a physicist, so I love technology. I'm a gadget freak. Um, it is our ability as a country to really take the lead in developing these next century technologies in these smart power plants, which are the other side of the smart grid. Today, we focus you know, exclusively on the demand side of the grid with our smart technologies, but we can now make the generation side smart. And that, that is tremendous innovation that the entire ecosystem of, of the power system is now smart. And we as a country can take the lead in developing these technologies and driving this forward and then ultimately exporting all of this to the rest of the world. Right. I think uh, we should now turn to um, our final panel member, Drew Murphy, um, who's already been complimented, at least on behalf of Southern California Edison for its leadership on these issues. Uh, Drew is the person in charge of strategic planning for, uh, uh, for Southern California Edison International, I should say, Edison International. So he's responsible for managing the overall uh, strategic planning process and its subsidiaries. And he's overseeing the analysis of emerging trends in the industry, as well as their impacts on the regulated uh, utility, which we uh, deal with here in California. But um, I wanna start by asking you about a, um, a, a plan that was produced a while back called the Pathway 2045, which was a, a white paper that outlined some significant investments that are needed to decarbonize the California economy. Uh, and to ask about grid investments that you foresee specifically coming up for your company, as well as for the state and the country as we head down this path towards uh, carbon neutrality. Well, thanks, Mary, and thanks to LABC for hosting this really important summit and really important conversation on grid investment, uh, which is something that is top of mind for us uh, right now, all of us, but particularly us at Edison. Um, and I am going to pull a little uh, regulatory uh, piece here because I've got to say this at the beginning, and Commissioner Rekshoff will appreciate this, that I might touch on something in my comments that relates to an open rate setting proceeding. And uh, if I do, and there's, and there's other decision makers from the PUC, PUC on the phone or on, in the conference listening, just let me know at some point during the conference or afterwards so that we can make sure we make the right regulatory ex parte filings. So with that disclaimer out of the way, uh, let me try to you know, sort of dig into your, your question, Mary, and there's a lot we could talk about here, but you mentioned uh, our Pathway 2045, which we put out a couple of years ago. Um, and the, you know, the goal of that was to really to, to take a look at how as a state can we get to 2045 and meet the state's really ambitious climate uh, and uh, climate objectives of carbon neutrality by 2045. And what does that mean across the whole economy as well as particularly focusing in the electric sector? Um, and, you know, I can give a little detail on sort of what we found, but obviously the, the primary drivers of what we think has to happen, I think we're all familiar with, and we've touched on them is, you know, continuing to further clean up the energy supply system, which is absolutely critical. But as we know, we've actually made a lot of progress. And Jennifer, you mentioned this in this state already. We've been at it a while here on this, and, and folks like Mary have been at the forum and, and Commissioner Rekshoff. And, um, so we actually need to turn next to the really urgently to the other sectors, particularly transportation, but also, also the building sector. Um, and uh, so there's a lot that has to happen. When you look at just the electric sector alone, though, and, uh, you know, some of our statistics around what we think has to happen 
are maybe a little bit different, but directionally the same as what we've heard previously in this discussion uh, today, which is, you know, significant amounts of new renewables. I mean, our numbers are something like at least 80 gigawatts of new utility scale, clean generation, mostly renewables, solar and wind, of course. Um, you know, 30, 30 gigawatts of utility scale storage, plus, you know, we're talking at least 10 of uh, sto- 10 gigawatts of storage from DER, so behind the meter, a lot of it in single family homes and businesses, uh, and also uh, 30 plus gigawatts of uh, solar, probably on people's rooftops. That could be up to as much as half of the homes in California. It's pretty um, daunting when you think about those numbers, as we know, and in addition to the electrification of the transportation sector, as I mentioned. So what does that mean for grid investment? Our rough numbers looking out to 2045 were about $250 billion of clean energy and grid infrastructure investments in across California. And that is a huge amount and to, to, to sort of get behind, but it also means a lot of opportunity. We'll talk about, we've talked about jobs. And I think that's the really interesting thing here if we get it right is the impact we can have in terms of job creation and, and impact on communities where that's really, really needed. So we, we need to talk about doing that in a way that really puts equity and a just transition first, I think. I think that's something maybe we'll talk about uh, later on. When you look at just the grid investment, rough numbers that we're looking at, um, probably about uh, $75 billion in grid investment by 2045, of which about $43 billion in our analysis was needed just for transmission infrastructure to import out of state power into California to connect it to the Cal ISO system. Um, about $14 billion, roughly, could be more uh, of additional, would be needed just to upgrade the local grid, so distribution and local transmission systems. Um, so that in itself is a significant amount, um, as you can imagine. So. We had this pathway paper out there and a lot of folks have come up with very similar analysis in California and across the country, you hear very similar sorts of directional things. What we did last year, and some of you probably heard about it, is we said, okay, how are we going to actually make sure that the grid is going to work? What is the grid going to have to look like? Um, Because it's going to have to be transformed. We've all talked about grid modernization for a while, but we think this is an even deeper dive into what it looks like to meet those 2045 goals. So we put out another white paper. You love to write white papers when you're in the strategy group, right? Um, and it's called Reimagining the Grid. And we look just at the SCE system, really, in our territory to try to figure out what kinds of uh, changes would we need to make in the grid to actually make this uh, happen. And while we haven't put sort of hard numbers on it yet, we're working on that now and other iteration in terms of actual dollars and categories. And a lot of this will depend on how things develop. It's clear that we're going to need to continue our grid modernization focus and double down on it with particular emphasis on things like uh, IT and OT. So, uh, you know, uh, Internet technology and control technologies that are going to be powered by high speed communications. So connecting the grid with with, you know, with communication systems is going to be very important and not just the grid but all the assets that connect to the grid. So both the utility scale generation, Tom was talking about smarter generation, absolutely. And then all of the distributed resources are gonna be connected as well. So we've gotta have sensors and communication and computing that ties that together, because what we're gonna to need to do to is really figure out how we can optimize the grid in much more real time than we do now uh, on a much more granular basis. One of the findings from this paper for us is that we will likely have grid in different parts of the grid, we'll have architectures that look different depending on the sort of the local conditions. So high density areas with lots of transportation, electrification assets and lots of DERs will look different than our less dense, more rural areas where it may be that it's more important to have uh, either microgrids or macrogrids and you know different different types of connections because we have uh, different needs for the grids. And we'll obviously have to harden the grid that is out in areas that are high fire risk, we'll need to do different things in urban areas. Uh, so the architecture of the grid will start to actually look different in different places. And that's something that we're really digging into now to figure out what does that mean? What does it mean for grid investment? And how are we gonna, how are we gonna make that happen? One of the things I wanna emphasize here is, and I think we've touched on it, this is not a, this is not something that one stakeholder that utility alone can solve. This is going to take first of all all the utilities in the state working together because we're all going to need to have 
be deploying these things consistently with similar standards and that work together. We're going to have to be working with the regulatory bodies, of course, the CPUC and the Cal ISO and others, the CEC. But we'll be needing to work with uh, all the, also the private sector and companies like Tom's because they're going to be deploying a lot of the actual resources on behalf of customers or contracted to us or the other utilities. So this is a multi-stakeholder effort that we have to get right. And it's 25 years, sounds like a long time to plan for this, but it's pretty short when you think about the planning cycles and the amount of investment we're talking about and how long it takes to get things done. So um, I know that um, you know that's something most of us are aware of, but that, that's a, the last thing I'd say is that this is something that's going to take all of us getting behind the way we are on this call today um, to make it happen and become a reality. Utility companies uh, historically, as uh, everyone knows, are very uh, place-based. They're very located in a particular service territory. And what you're suggesting is something that uh, really transcends that um, in terms of the need for interconnectedness, but also for thinking together. Um, do you think we have the mechanisms in place to do that? I, I think we're developing them. I, I think this is a journey we're on together, you know, and uh, right now, I mean, the, the, the IRP process that is, you know, that we're all going through is a really important process. And we're working on developing that to be a much more effective tool for planning how the grid is going to develop. For those who don't know, that's the integrated resource planning process that we go through as utilities and the other load serving entities that serve all of the electric customers in the state. Um, I think that um, we need to continue to develop more um, integration between the other um, bodies that sort of are involved, you know, the, uh, and so that's something that I think we continue to push for. Um, reliability planning, I'll just, you know, say I think what we discovered last summer with the rolling outages we had was the fact that we had, we had the systems in place to do it, but I think there were clearly lessons that were, could be learned. And I think the report that Cal ISO put out, you know, sort of underscores that where we could be working together better and where planning uh, could be done uh, to, you know, in a different way if we're working together on it. And that's an example of where we can't afford to have that happen in that way again, probably for many reasons, but especially if all of us are relying on the grid to, you know, electrify more and more of our economy in our lives. So I think there's more we can do, but I think we have a lot of it that we're working on. Great. I didn't uh, plant that question with you, but it now makes me want to turn to uh, Commissioner Rechshoff and then ask a question about the integrated resource planning process. If, it, if I can do that uh, here, I guess my question for you would be, do you see this process as being the place where these kinds of issues are going to be able to be addressed? Is that Part of your intent and and what's going on there. Forgive me if I, I haven't. Uh, yes, <laughs> I I do see that. That's the point of the integrated resource planning process. It's designed so that we, as a regulator, and more importantly, the load serving entities that provide electricity to our customers, plan for everything. They consider reliability, safety, affordability, climate, because they have to meet GHG reduction targets as well as other goals that the legislature has said, uh, set, uh, such as reducing uh, pollutants and a special focus on reducing pollutants in disadvantaged communities. So it's very much designed to be holistic, forward thinking. We do 10 year planning cycles and actually we are looking more toward the 2030s and even our 2045 goal uh, in, in that process. I should point out, we. We only regulate in this process that I'm describing covers the investor-owned utilities. They're comparable processes that the, the uh, large publicly owned utilities, including LADWP, go through to plan for how they're going to reach the state's climate targets. I should mention one other thing that's important, Mary. We are now working very constructively with our sister agencies, including the Energy Commission and the Air Resources Board, to start planning for what we need to get to our 2045 goals. That goes beyond our integrated resource planning process. The state conducted a series of studies under SB 100 about scenarios for getting to our 2045 goal of zero carbon electricity. And while the, the statute only requires that we have reports every four years, the agencies themselves are now 
engaged in a stakeholder process to try to look at a whole bunch of issues that relate to meeting those goals, including permitting issues, land use issues, resource issues, economic and job issues, and so forth. So that's, in some sense, the IRP plus process. It's, it's beyond the statutory mandate of the IRP, but it's designed to be holistic and look at what we need as a state to do to get to these very deep decarbonization goals, including, and this may tease up another question you have, including if we want to accelerate those goals <laughs> yes. and, and take advantage of great things that the Biden administration or Congress are doing. Right, right. So <clears throat> I, I hate to sort of keep uh, circling back, but this is the nature of this kind of a discussion, I think, is that somebody puts out an idea or a comment and then it becomes a, a question that goes back to something that was already said. So um, I guess I would go back to uh, what Tom was talking about <clears throat> in terms of the challenges uh, with the investment tax credits in, in terms of being able to actually get uh, regionally significant projects built uh, and ask the question both for you and, and uh, ask Tom if he wants to engage a little bit further here in terms of <clears throat> do, we, do we really see the ability to actually build these things even when we say we want them and it's what we need, you know, do we think we actually are going to be able to get there? Well, I think we are. I can't control, unfortunately, I can't control the timing of the investment tax credit or the awarding of of the allocation of, 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 of tax credits, although I am optimistic what this, that this Congress and this administration will, will, uh, will do very positive things in this regard. We faced sim a similar situation 10 years ago when we had to build a lot uh, to take advantage of, of opportunities under the, the uh, uh, stimulus bill in, 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 in 20, 2009, 2010, and we built an unprecedented amount of renewable energy in California. People said we couldn't do it. There are too many challenges. It's too hard. Permitting is too difficult. And we did it. We exceeded expectations. We built uh, important transmission lines, including the first policy-driven transmission line uh, in the country to Hatchapi. We built a Sunrise Power Link project that built, brings energy to load in, in Southern California. So I think we can do it. I think uh, there's a lot of resolve in this interagency collaboration that I'm talking about. It gives me a lot of uh, optimism, along with uh, the cooperation that I, we, I, we know we're going to get from the Biden administration. We had a very successful partnership between the state and federal government and the resource agencies and the land management agencies to bring to, uh, to, bring to bear uh, in the 2010s that helped with the installation of a lot of those renewable energy resources uh, that I'm talking about. I should point out one minor thing in response to the, one of the first things Tom said, which is concerns about the ability of agencies and the, the length of time for them to do environmental analysis and the lack of resources for them to do that. There is money that was proposed by Governor Newsom in the May revision. I hope it's still there. I know the legislature is considering final changes to the budget in this week and next week, but there's money there to front load and pay for environmental analysis by the state's coastal, coastal resource agencies to start analysis of some of the resources resource impacts associated with offshore wind development. So that's an example where we're saying, we know we need to do it, even though we don't have specific projects in front of us, let's provide st staffing and money so that we can get that analysis started sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. I should just say, did, who had, Tom, were you gonna say something there? Yeah. yeah I was gonna chime in, um, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, we can do this, I think it's, long as you know panels like us talk about the real topics and address them and and create the awareness um, and i think it's a huge team effort right um, you ask me about technology and all that but let's not forget about you know the workforce training um, creating these great jobs um, there's a lot of momentum there um, where i think our tight collaboration that we've shown in california together with the unions we can create great jobs and we can build projects on schedule, on budget. Um, it's very important that this all works in unison and, and that we, you know, that we act as a team with a common goal. Um, and I'm absolutely convinced. And, and 
um, <clears throat> what, what, what Cliff talked about earlier, um, uh, when I started this company 12 years ago, people thought that the 20% and then 33% was unattainable. And today <laughs> we've exceeded it ahead of schedule. It is doable. We just have to go out there and push and get the policies in place. And, and I hope that Washington gets its act together and passes the legislature that we do need. But if not, we'll figure it out. Um, we're, we're, this train cannot be stopped. The economics of renewables are incredible now. 10 years ago was a trade-off. You know, clean power that was expensive versus dirty power that was cheap. And the argument was, you know, you don't want to kill the economy. That argument is dead. It is now investment in the future that will provide us with clean and cheaper and more reliable. Think about this number. Our power plant that you see behind us, um, we're guaranteeing an uptime of over 99%. A gas-fired power plant, according to NERC data, is between 80 and 85% in terms of availability. That's a massive difference uh, if you think about you know, the time when it's not available from less than 1% to, to somewhere around you know, 15 to 20%. That's an order of magnitude. So this, this is coming. This, there is no stopping this. The question is, how do we accelerate that? And I think that's a fun question to have. It, it's great. It's like, you know, making an investment in a new piece of equipment earlier, it has huge payoff. And, and how do we accelerate that process? Thanks. But I, I, I want to jump in. Yeah, I want to jump in for a second because, you know, we're having a lot of great conversation around, you know, the business aspects and the regulatory aspects. But I think, Tom, if I can be so bold, you touched on a, a topic that is so near and dear to my heart, and that is, the investment in the workforce aspect. And one of the things that's so critical and one of the one of the reasons why what we've done in California is so significant is because we've created great union jobs in clean energy. We've been able to demonstrate through all of the utilities that are on the phone today or on this presentation, SoCal Edison, LADWP is here, Clean Power Alliance County of Los Angeles is also here. All of these different entities are entities that have really said, Labor is an investment. It's not a cost, it's an investment. And we are going to invest in our labor as much as we invest in all these different aspects of buying and selling utility to the end users. So part of what is so significant about this is when I am asked from different stakeholders, how are you going to create good jobs in clean energy? Uh, the good jobs are in fossil energy. I, I smile and half giggle and say, because it's already been done. Because we've already done it in places like California where we have apprenticeship-based career pathways, where we have an investment in workforce and where we don't see labor as much of a cost as we see it as an investment. And where we are already working on building back better through targeted hiring on our project labor agreements. So I wanted to kind of make sure that that is part of what we're talking about as well in terms of clean energy also can bring union careers, not jobs, careers, and some of the great organizations in this, within this panel and also within this, you know, this virtual collective um, event that we're at today have already demonstrated that. So that's, that's part of the reason that, you know, for us, I think it's very obvious but I know for many people who are in different parts of the country and involved in different types of energy procurement are not aware that the things that the Biden administration is going to do are things that have been already done and are available to be implemented in other places because we've already developed the model here in California. Well, it's great that you're in a position to help hold up that model and talk to people about it, despite the fact that up until now, I know we haven't really been able to have people all working together in those offices back in Washington, you know, where they, where they need to be sometimes to spread the message. Do you get any sense yet that there is uh, an, an uptake or an ability on the part of your colleagues uh, to sort of spread the word so we're not just talking to ourselves? <laughs> I, I do. You know, we're 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 led obviously by the White House. We're obviously led by um, President Biden, uh, Vice President Harris, who's another Yay. amazing person from California. If I can just continue to sing our praises, but there are so many of us in the space who are collectively thinking about 
How do we create more worker equity? How do we create more union jobs? And how do we erase the false narrative of it's fossil energy or it's clean energy and labors with fossil energy, but in clean energy, there aren't those jobs. It's really a question of, we are creating clean energy. There is work to be created. Are we going to create careers or are we going to create jobs? Clean energy is not a new industry anymore. And there are innovators and people like 8-Minute who've already demonstrated that it can be done. So the question is, how can we get there quicker and faster? We know we're going to get there. How do we bring everybody with us? So uh, maybe I could ask Drew, even though this isn't precisely your area, but um, operating at a level that is not just within the state of California, how do you see us being able to kind of transmit some of our thinking? Uh, we can implant our people, I guess, in the administration, and we've already done quite a bit of that. That's very important and helpful, but I'm wondering if you see any other uh, venues or opportunities out there that we might be able to take advantage of. Oh, it's a it's a question we actually think about a lot, Mary, um, and I think you know important to all of us. So at least from a medicine standpoint, one of the things that we take very seriously is trying to you know take the thought leadership that's going on in the state um, and actually sort of use that to help uh, drive the conversation and the efforts in other other places. We engage in a couple of very specific places. We are very involved in our industry trade association, the Edison Electric Institute, um, where we have. I think taken a pretty leading role in um, uh, driving the conversation first around clean energy, but most recently uh, around transportation electrification is one of the things that really happened. So, you know, my boss, uh, our CEO Pedro Pizarro, is the has been the co-chair of this transportation electrification uh, task force that EEI has had for several years, and we've I think together with the other members had really good engaging conversations that have led to. The utilities there who aren't as far along in their states actually lo looking at us and other places where we're doing things like our charge ready program, which is um, something I can talk about, where we showed that as a model. And now they can take that to their commissioners and the folks in their states and say, hey, it works here. Like in California, it's working like this. Can we do something similar? So we've tried to have conversations like that at, uh, at the trade associations. There's a company called the Electric Power Research Institute, which is the industry's research arm that we all collectively help fund and drive. We're very engaged there on the technology side. Um, we do engage in Washington and a lot of the other uh, groups. Uh, Mary, you're familiar with some of them on the, electric, on, the, on the electric vehicle side that we've been involved in. So it's something that all of us, certainly in the management team, uh, take seriously. Um, and I, I, think it makes, I think it makes a difference because to Jennifer's point, you can demonstrate that we've actually done it uh, to Tom's point that it's actually it works even if you think it may not be possible and you can do it on the time frames that have been set. So engaging in Washington with the administration and on the Hill is important, but there are a lot of other venues, I think, that um, we we can engage in that we try to do trade associations, all of the all of the groups that we we, we talk to the auto manufacturers continuously. Uh, about what their plans are and try to uh, work with them, the truck manufacturers. Um, so one of the things the utility did recently was put all of its electrification team together into one team that's very outward facing for customers and for the uh, automakers and the folks who are trying to actually put projects in place so that we can have a team that's not, they don't have to go to many places, different places in the utility if they wanna figure out how do we put chargers in or how do I electrify? It's a one-stop shop approach you know, lots of organizations have that, but that's something we've tried to do organizationally to actually make this better. And we've tried to export that model where others are interested in hearing what we're doing. And it's been well received. So that's so some of the ideas that we have. Well, one of the things that I uh, constantly am being made aware of now that I am no longer responsible day to day for an agency and actually get to read some of the things that come across my desk, is the big disconnect between what those of us who are working in the field understand is being done and can be done and a lot of the kind of secondhand uh, journalism that we read, um, articles, even, even op-ed type pieces, which tend to sort of take a very 
gosh, this is so hard. Can we possibly do it? You know, it's going to be more than the system can bear. And, and this issue about the grid and the need to modernize it <clears throat> is kind of in that category because I mean, we're all agreeing that massive investments are needed, work needs to be done, but you know, our attitude is, well, okay, let's do it. Let's figure out the best way to do it and let's go get it done. And an awful lot of the um, uh, information that I think filters out to the public is, um, gee, this is gonna be really hard and maybe we shouldn't try because we won't get there. You know, I, I, I find it very, um, and I, I hear a lot of this as I go around and, you know, talk to different groups of more like regular people as well, that the message is just not quite getting through uh, that, you know, we're already doing this stuff. We just need to do it more and better and faster than, than what we're doing right now. That's just a kind of a general lament, I guess, on my part. But I'm wondering if you feel, if, if any of you agree with me about that, and if you do, whether you have any suggestions for how we could be um, engaging sort of opinion leaders that aren't directly involved as, with us as the practitioners uh, in, in getting kind of a a, a more realistic overall sense uh, that this can be done. I believe that the president is out there trying to actually make my point and probably doing it better than I am. I'm sure he is, but I'm just curious if you see any other uh, any other ways that uh, we could be we we could be educating folks about this. Well, maybe one thing I'll know to say that we touched on it earlier a little bit. I think is really important, and you're right, Mary, that we're sort of in the group that talks about this all the time and knows it's happening. And there, but there's a lot of people who don't see the, the impacts day to day. And particularly in communities and in groups that are, you know, for lower income, dis more disadvantaged. I mean, if you look at the, you know, sort of where a lot of the clean energy resources have been deployed, particularly distributed resources, because of the way we have structured the subsidies and the things that have incentivized them, they have not necessarily showed up evenly across our, um, across society, and certainly in California. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us as the, the leaders and the thought leaders to, at this point in time, to not only look at how to create jobs that are equitably um, sort of deployed and dispersed, but also make sure that the resources are, are deployed that way. And that's going to require funding, different and more funding sources so that we make sure that the folks who can't necessarily afford these things out of the box in the way we're, they're structured right now, they, they can't afford them. I and mean, EV is a great example. There are, there are ways to get clean vehicles into, into lower income communities, that, but they require different programs and different subsidies than we've had today. The same with solar um, and this benefit to that. And we know that in Southern California, the impacts of transportation on qual air quality, put aside greenhouse gas emissions, but you know this, Mary, because of CARB. I mean, if we could, if we could deploy more electric vehicles and more electrification into those communities, we'd have the double, double benefit of addressing our greenhouse gas emissions um, goals as well as cleaning up the air and, and improving health results. And I think we have to, I think that's one way to make it tangible for people, back to your question, in a way that makes it more real to a broader group of people, perhaps. Mary, uh, I'm, I'm very glad you have time to read. That's fantastic. That's really <laughs> good to hear. But I'm going to take issue with the premise of your question, because I don't okay. know that I agree. Of course, I'm in the middle of it. So you're now on the outside with some perspective. I don't know that I agree that we haven't been successful in communicating the message. I look at what the public talks about and what's being talked about in our political discourse. And it's now it seems almost unimaginable three or five years ago. So you have California with extremely ambitious decarbonization goals. And the dialogue now is how do we accelerate those goals, not whether we can meet them. The costs of wind and solar and batteries and car batteries have gone down so much faster than people thought. It's, it's head spinning. And we have a very serious discussion at the federal level now about a clean electricity, 100% clean electricity standard by 2035, which again was, was almost unimaginable a few years ago. So I think a lot of the public, at least in the energy space, we can 
there's a ch many challenges in transportation electrification and building electrification. But in the power sector, I think there's a good segment of the public that sees real progress and, and sees very ambitious goals within close reach. No, you're right. I, I guess I was uh, really referring back to my fixation, which is transportation, because we have achieved so much with respect to uh, the electrical system. Uh, the focus of this panel or the title of it related to the grid and grid modernization, but several people and probably everybody has, at some point has, has uh, pointed out the uh, connection, which is no longer even a question. Uh, between the transformation that we need to make with our transportation system and what's going on in the electricity sector as well. It just um, points up once again that uh, sometimes when we achieve success, we don't necessarily take the time to um, appreciate it. We just got to move on to whatever the next big problem is and uh, maybe don't uh, appreciate it much, as much how much has been accomplished in a very short uh, amount of time. I know everyone on this panel is an optimist uh, or you wouldn't be doing the work that you do. Uh, and we have a lot to congratulate ourselves about actually uh, right at this moment. Uh, my, my feeling, I guess, is just that um, we still face some pretty significant opposition in the Congress. Uh, it, it is partisan uh, to a considerable extent, but it's not totally uh, partisan, because even within the Democratic uh, Party, there still are uh, serious pockets, I guess, of, uh, that are based on geography as much as anything else, uh, where people uh, think that, that there's something strange and exotic about electric vehicles or about uh, renewable uh, power as a whole. And maybe that's just the transition that we're in at the moment and that we're, we're all uh, in the midst of it. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on that. I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm always struck when I go out and I do quite a bit of this now, in, in effect, I am the California person, you know, on various um, academic programs and webinars sponsored by groups and stuff that uh, we, we do seem to be the, uh, the, uh, outlier in a good way, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the other side of being a model, I guess, is that you get treated as though you're doing something very strange and exotic. Maybe that isn't even true anymore. I guess, uh, you know, Tom, your business isn't just California based, you, you're working around in the West as well. You encounter similar kinds of uh, enthusiasm when you go into other states. Yeah, I think um, it, it varies. And I, I do think you have a fair point, which is I think um, we could probably do a better job of telling the narrative. Um, and, and, you know, I think one of the topics is, is when you talk about California taking the lead, um, the rest of the country looks at California probably a little differently than we look at it from the inside. Um, they see that our retail energy prices are high. We don't tell the story that our wholesale energy prices in California are actually lower than in Texas. Mm -hmm. That's a story that's not being told. And, and quite frankly, I don't think 99% of the population would, would even dream of that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot that can be said. And, and one thing that personally excites me a lot, and, and I think this is a little bit of a vision um, that I'm pushing um, for Southern California. Um, I think we are in a very unique position here in Southern California um, to do what Northern California, the you know, San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley did you know, 40, 50 years ago of becoming the global leader in computing. Mm -hmm. I think in Southern California, we can become the global leader in the clean energy transition. And according to recent estimates, that's a $30 trillion business. That is a lot of jobs, that is a lot of money. So it's not just labor, it's capitalists, everybody's sitting there um, being able to not only do good for the planet, but also good for the economy. And I think that's a narrative that needs to be told much more so that this isn't just fighting climate change, which is a hugely important topic, but this is also the future of our economy. That's where we're going. That's where the future is. 
that's where you should get training for your career. Sorry, I nearly said jobs. Yeah. Um, for your career, um, that's where the future is. You know, Silicon Valley, that was 40 years ago. Um, we are the new generation. This is where it's happening. And I think that's an exciting story. Maybe we can get some people from Hollywood to help us tell it. I'm sure that the LA Business Council is particularly enthusiastic about that message since that's been the focus of their work for a long time now. And uh, yeah, it is, it is definitely beginning to, to take hold. I, I think that uh, we're already at the point where, you know, Southern California, which once had a considerable automotive manufacturing capacity, and then went through a period where we had no uh, auto plants at all. When I moved out to LA in 1971, there were actually three big operating uh, auto manufacturers in the LA region. And uh, it was uh, somewhat uh, gradual, but you know, within a pretty short period of time, we went from three big employers to zero. And it was one of those things that was kind of a shock to the system. And uh, over a period of time, it's coming back, but in a completely different way, you know, where electric transportation is now uh, booming, but in companies that at that time, nobody had ever heard of, which is helpful in the sense that it gives you some uh, optimism about the economy itself being resilient and the, how creativity and policy can, can come together to, to really build a, a whole new uh, industry. But it's, uh, Definitely looking back, no one would have predicted it, um, you know, in the 1980s that we would be where, where we are today with respect to uh, electric transportation. Um, I had a question that came in from um, uh, one of the uh, attendees. Uh, we're not, you know, taking audience questions on this panel, but I try to monitor the chat that's going on just to see if there's something that people are uh, anxious about. And there, there was a question that was raised about the Biden administration's recent announcement about um, major investments in green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, which I for years have tried to constantly remind people that electric transportation isn't only battery powered electric uh, transportation, that a fuel cell is also a form of electric drivetrain. And that even though it doesn't look exactly the same and you get your fuel from a different place, that we should at least be considering it on an ongoing basis as, uh, as an option and one that we shouldn't just uh, write off uh, given that we don't, you know, we're, we're on a good path, but we're not where we, where we need to get. And I'm just uh, interested whether any members of the panel uh, would be willing to jump in and make a comment on that issue about future, the future role for, um, for the hydrogen-based economy as well. Uh, Jennifer, you gonna take that one? Yeah, uh, especially because it's from my, my beloved uh, Department of Energy and all of our uh, great people there who are working on um, energy supply and in this and in this particular case, hydrogen, you know, that's one of the areas that we are really focusing on and have been really thinking about at the Department of Energy because we know that there are a lot of conversations around gas and around hydrogen. And we know that hydrogen really has the potential to create a lot of great union jobs. So it's one of the areas that we're very interested in. And I think... Um, Mary, you and I have had the benefit of being in the transportation space and knowing that battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric are also both zero emission. Right. So they're, they are both great complementary approaches. One area is just much further developed than the other area, but hydrogen also potent creates a lot of great um, can create a lot of great union jobs. And there are places in the country that are more advanced than that. Um, not California yet, darn it. And that's why I wanna do a little plug for our loans program office at the Department of Energy, because we are definitely interested in funding investments in the energy space, specifically ones that create great union jobs. So there's a little plug for our LPO office in Jickershaw who is heading that up, who many of you know from all of our prior interactions in the energy space. but 
it's definitely something that we're that we are pursuing and definitely something that deserves much more conversation in this space because it does have a lot of great climate potentials as well. Okay, I've just received the message from our uh, sponsors that I am out of time. <laughs> we have we have used up all of the time that we had. We're just barely scraping the surface, but hopefully we have moved the discussion on uh, in a way that will give people something to uh, take back with them and to work on and join us as we continue this effort uh, to uh, make California uh, the leader that it has been and, and will continue to be uh, in the clean energy space. So uh, without further ado, I think I need to turn this back to- Thank you. Somebody, thank you, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, thank you. Mary. Thanks. <laughs> thank you.